Well, we are here this morning, and it is a different kind of morning. And so this morning, I'm actually going to uh, spend some time talking about baptism and what it looks like. We've been, over the last several weeks, looking at perspective. We're talking about having that, that fuller perspective that Isaiah 6 I saw the, high, the Lord high and lifted up kind of moment that he experienced and how that propelled his life and directed what he would even continue in his ministry doing. And then this past week, we talked about keeping that perspective. And we celebrated the Lord's Supper. It was um, an opportunity for us to stop and to do what we call one of those ordinances of the church, one of those things that Jesus has given us to do, to do in remembrance of him. And so I taught specifically on the Lord's Supper and what that means to us as believers. And then we partook of the Lord's Supper together this past week. And now we are seeing the other ordinance of the church, the other thing that Jesus has given us as kind of markings of his people, and that is baptism. And so I want to spend a little time this morning talking about what we're going to be watching, even as we have heard testimonies and stories from individuals, so that we all are in this celebration together. If you have a Bible, if you would open it up to Matthew's Gospel, chapter 5. I'm going to read just four verses, beginning in verse 13 through verse 16. Matthew chapter 5, 13 through 16. If you have your place, if you would stand in honor of God's word, and we will read that together. God's word says this, You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has become tasteless, how can it be made salty again? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand. And it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Would you pray with me? Father, I ask as we have this opportunity as Randall said, to stop and just to be with you, I pray that you would speak. God, thank you for each individual who is here this morning, whether they are here because this is home church and this is where they come week after week to join with the body, or whether they are a guest, maybe here to support and encourage someone today who is being baptized. I pray that all of us would hear from you and would hear what you'd have to say to us. God, I pray that you would speak through your spirit and by your power. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. I want to point out just a couple things this morning for us from this passage and kind of relating that to the idea of baptism and following along with this idea of living out the perspective that we've been talking about. So the first thing I want you to see is this. Our faith's perspective is to be evident and expected it is to be evident and expected our faith's presence is to be normal it's to be natural that we are living this thing out um, i don't know if you realize this but you're actually um, not only in the midst of greatness because we have our god that we are worshiping today um, but we have someone who has done something that few people have opportunity and privilege to do if you put up the slide, this is a picture of my mom, <laughs> who is here this morning, who Friday got her very first hole-in-one playing golf. <laughs> she planned it so she could be here so I could talk about it. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> However, I will tell you this, in thinking about what is expected and evident in our lives when you have a moment like this guess what you tell people about it it becomes part of what you do and so before she was ever off the golf course pictures were coming 
uh, to family, uh, whether they are here or out in California, we were finding out about this moment together. There were Facebook page, uh, posts being made. In fact, a profile picture even changed so that it could follow her everywhere she went. I, I can relate to this. I, I know what that's like. I, I did tell her, though, it, she did it on the very first hole. I said, did you quit? It doesn't, it doesn't get any better. Unless you just think, man, maybe I can do it the second time too. I don't know. But that is one of those things. This is what happens when you have a moment and you experience something. You begin to talk about it and you talk about it as a natural part of living life. That's what this is about. And you look at this passage and you see that. Salt. Salt is supposed to be salty. Right? It's supposed to do all those normal things that salt does, preserve, cleanse, flavor. It's to be doing those things. A city on a hill, it's put there to point people both to its presence and its confidence of its people. Sitting there for all to see as a marker that maybe a wayward person might find it and be able to be led towards it. A light. A light is meant to shine. Right? No one would say, let's go by this light and then go hide it. That's what Jesus is saying here. That this light, its identity is to bring light and um, the ability to see. It doesn't make sense that you would do anything different. And in the same way, we as Christians are to be clearly evident. In our families, in our communities, in our workplaces, yes, even in our schools, The effects of our presence in a community should be felt. It should be a normal thing for us to be on display, showing Jesus Christ to this world. I've often asked our church, if we were to disappear from our community, how would our community change? Would it notice that we are no longer here You see, we are called to be people who are living out of faith that is evident and expected, normal, natural. If you have an Isaiah 6 moment, if you have a moment of salvation, those things become a topic of conversation. If you have a vibrant life with Christ, where he is showing you things from his word, and where he is speaking to you in a way that he, you see the guiding of his Holy Spirit in your life, those things naturally come out from you. Second thing I want you to see is this. Our faith's presence is to show a different perspective. Look at verse 16. It says, let your light shine before men in such a way. There's a purpose. Let your light shine in such a way. So there's reason for this. It's not about you. Right? There is a purpose for this life that we have lived in Christ. It is so that they might see your good deeds and praise your Father who is in heaven or glorify your Father who's in heaven. What is to be evident then? It's the working out of that faith. It's your witness, your testimony. It's the Spirit who indwells you. These are to affect the lifestyle that you live, the words that you choose to speak, the attitudes that you choose to embrace, the behaviors you choose to have, the actions that you choose to take. It's who you are. It's your identity. For those who have made Christ their their Lord and their Savior, they are saying, my identity is so wrapped up with Jesus that he affects everything that I do and everything that I am, and it's pointing the world to a different way of living life. We have six people this morning whose obedience to this newfound faith is proclaiming a different perspective to the world. Whether they are school-age kids proclaiming that they're not going to want, they don't want to grow up like maybe many of their peers in the next generation, or maybe it's a high schooler who's making a huge statement, identifying herself with Christ in a school environment where too often Christianity is met with mockery and rebellion. Whether it's a young married couple refusing to continue down paths set by themselves and reliant on their own strength and their own ability to control the world. In such a way, there's such a way this morning 
is to come before this congregation, to those who are watching online, to be able to say that I follow Jesus in public baptism. Baptism is one of those two ordinances of the church. And an ordinance is basically a religious ritual or religious activity, something that you do that demonstrates your obedience to a faith. Just as the Lord's Supper proclaims our continued ongoing commitment to Christ, the gospel, his eventual return, which we celebrated this morning in life group, baptism proclaims our identification with Christ and our pledge to that continued ongoing commitment to him. Now hear this, as we watch what's about to happen, understand baptism doesn't save you, it doesn't save anyone. It is the outward expression of something that's already experienced internally in transformation. It follows professions of faith and salvation. But the imagery of baptism is beautiful. You have a a person who enters the water. If often water is seen as that cleansing, that renewal, and they submit themselves to someone else for baptism. That person then is put into the water fully below the water, symbolizing that they've been buried with Christ and they're brought up out of the water, representing that newness of life that they've been given in Christ. It's a proclamation that they've given up on life without Christ to meet their greatest needs and to solve their greatest problems. It's their proclamation that Christ is Savior, that Christ is Lord, God, and King. It is their proclamation that Jesus has done what they could not. In his demonstration of divinity, Jesus was able to live a life without sin in communion and relationship with the Father. He was able to go to a cross so that sinners could be restored to God by paying for their sin. But Jesus doesn't stay dead. And just as those who will soon come out of the water in baptism, baptism points to the proclamation that Jesus rose from the grave and is alive now. There's an ongoing process of changing more and more lost sinners into adopted and beloved children. And our faith's presence shows the world a different perspective. These baptisms this morning point to a different way of life. They point to God's glory. They point to his power, his love, and his grace. Third thing I want you to see is this. Our faith's presence is an ongoing call to obedience. It's an ongoing call to obedience. There is in this passage in Matthew chapter 5 a call to obedience. The shift in perspective requires response. Look again at the passage. It talks about you are the salt of the earth, but then it goes on to say, but if salt becomes tasteless, how can it be made salt again? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. It says you're the light of the world, the city on the hill. No, no one takes a lamp and puts it under a basket but on a lampstand. And then in verse 16, it starts off with the command, let your light then therefore shine before men. It is a call to obedience. A call to a response life. And so the question for all of us as we watch these walk in obedience, as they Live out Matthew chapter 28 where it says teaching them to obey everything I commanded. It says baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We're watching these individuals be obedient to what Jesus says. Repent and be baptized. Right? This idea that they know, oh, I've received Jesus. What does Jesus want me to do? I'm supposed to get baptized and identify with him. This is their, really that first big step of obedience for them. But here's the point for us. As we watch this this morning, they are preaching a gospel to us. And they're demonstrating obedience. And they're calling us to continued obedience. One of the things I love about Paul when he writes to the Romans or he writes to some of the other churches and he says, man, I I know you're immature in your faith, but my faith is mutually encouraged by yours. I see what you're doing, and I'm excited about it. And I I pray that God still more and more works in and through your lives. 
And so this morning, I hope and I pray that we as a church are energized by what we get to watch. That we are reminded through their testimonies, through their obedience, that we have a God who is powerful to save. And there may be someone that you have on your heart, and you know, I, I just want them to know the Lord. And maybe this is that moment this morning where it just reminds you that God does continue to work in lives, young and older. And he can bring sinners to himself through the gospel. It may be a, a challenge this morning for some of you because maybe you've made a profession of faith and you haven't gotten baptized yet. Understand, that's, that's an act of obedience that, that Christ is calling you to. He says, proclaim me, identify with me. And that's the call that he's put on every believer's life. It's to identify themselves with him. And then maybe you are a, a baptized believer. Maybe you're journeying a path. And maybe right now, there's just a call to obedience. That he says, remember these truths. Remember what it was like to walk with me. I'm calling you again. And there may be something on your heart that you need to put aside. There may be something that you've been, you know you've been called to do, but you have been rebellious. And you haven't done it. There's something you need to surrender to the Lord. Something you need to seek his power to be able to accomplish. Because in your own flesh you can't do it. We are here this morning watching obedience. And I don't want you to miss it. Yes, we are celebrating with them. But we are also being called again to that same obedience in Christ. What an incredible privilege it is this morning to watch the Holy Spirit lead individuals not only to salvation but into obedience. And that same Spirit who indwells you offers that this morning for you to continue in that process so that whether you're a hot mess or not, the Spirit of God is here. And so we have this treasure in earthen vessels. So the power is not of man, but of God. We, this morning, proclaim God moves. That is cause for celebration. Will you pray with me? Father, I thank you for this truth. I thank you for baptism. I thank you for the declaration that each one of these individuals is making not only in um, being baptized, but also in the words that they are speaking. And I thank you for the encouragement that that is to the body. As we, as family, as we get to celebrate with them. But Lord, I also thank you because it's a reminder and a call back to the very things that one time in our past we held to and we embraced and we followed through in obedience and we have continued hopefully to walk in that obedience and maybe it's a call this morning to come back and depend upon you again because we've gotten a big head about ourselves and we thought we could do it on our own and maybe this is just a call to come back to christ through the power that you supply maybe it's that we have forgotten perspective and maybe we need the Isaiah 6 again. And this morning, we get to lift our eyes to watch the work of God in the lives of these individuals. And maybe that once again calls us to a perspective that this world has led us from keeping our gaze upon. Lord, and however we need to respond this morning, may we not just be observers May we be those who participate in what is happening today. Whether that's the baptisms, the testimonies, whether that's the songs or the preaching. Lord, may all of those things, may we find ourselves in those things. And may your spirit use them this morning to keep moving us in the direction that you've called us to so that we let our lights shine in a way that people would see them and glorify you. But 
others would come to know you. Whether it's in that, this community of living that out, whether it's in our homes, our works, or schools, wherever we find ourselves along the way, God, would you be on display? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.